and a 10-year-old fifth grader. The 10-year-old rule the roost? No. Good. <laughs> <laughs> that is classic. No, not at all. It says we are now live on Facebook. Yeah, I think we're good to go. Hello, everyone. We are in uh, episode 13 of season two of the Bayshore Christian Alumni Podcast, and we've got a very special guest tonight. I have not seen my friend in this way. It's got to be 20, 30, 4 years. 20 uh, years. Uh, so I'm very thankful to have tonight my my great friend since we were little. Uh, yep. Elementary school, Kevin Daniels. Kevin, thanks for joining us. No problem. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's great. I mean, uh, you look great. Um, you know, the years have done you kindly. Uh, Tell us about uh, since graduation, college, family, kids, tell us all those things. Wow, okay. Uh, graduation, came to Houston, to college, uh, to Texas Southern, came here. Uh, I thought I was gonna be a pharmacist, but uh, Dr. Colbert in advanced biology convinced me otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Why did so, he want to talk? What did, what did he want you to do? No, no, no. So Dr. Colbert was was very, very old school. And after our first e exam of the semester, I remember like it was yesterday, she walks in. There's like 20 of us in the class. She has all of our exams in her hand and she slams them down on the desk. She, she says, some of y'all need to consider tech school. <laughs> So that was our indoctrination to the fact that uh, we may have thought we were smart, but no, we were going to have to work. So uh, I switched over from pharmacy to physics, but I had the theory down, but my math was not strong enough. Calculus killed me. You mean so, that, base, that base your math wasn't good enough? Uh, no, it was not. Uh, <laughs> Then I said, okay, well, well, what do you, what do I love? I love literature. So I'm going to be an English major because, you know, maybe I want to go to law school one day. So I switched. I became an English major, uh, graduated English minor in communication, got my master's degree, worked on my PhD for three years at Tulane. Uh, Katrina came, family stuff came ended up being uh, all but dissertation from Tulane, got married. Which by the way, we saw a picture of your wife. You obviously uh, married up. Way up brother, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my weight. Uh, <laughs> uh, got married, have three kids, three beautiful kids. Kevin Jr. is 21. He's at Texas Southern, my alma mater. So he's legacy, uh, comp sci major, 15 year old daughter, and a 10 year old daughter, both at a uh, private school here in Houston uh, called Westbury Christian. Is that the same school that Kelvin's daughter goes to? She used to go there. She's in, uh, she's at a different school now. Okay, yeah, yeah. That, that's really cool. And, and so y'all, I mean, do you see your brother much? Uh, oh, fine. he lives maybe eight, nine minutes from me. Did in a you much bigger house. That was a, that was a great line when you said about your your professor with the with to, to go to tech school. I don't know if you remember the movie The Paper Chase about the lawyer. The professor comes in and says, "Here's a dime. Go call your mother. Tell her you will not be graduating from law school." And that's what I thought of when you mentioned your professor there. Yeah, so those those old school HBCU professors were very very blunt to say the least. Good, good. I like that. Um, so English major, what are you doing now? I mean, are you, you're teaching, right? I mean, I'm teaching high school. Uh, That's great. Teach AP English. Uh, I did a little bit of community college, but I decided to stop doing that because that's essentially 13th grade. So I just didn't want to do that. Uh, so I teach, I run behind my children with all of their activities, uh, try to be a good father and a good husband. So that takes up all my time. Oh, that that's really great. What uh, being an English teacher, what, what is your what what was the most influential writer or 
book or what, what influenced you the most, if you, if you remember? Uh, two favorite texts, most influential texts. Of course, the first would be The Fire Next Time, James Baldwin, the greatest mind of the 20th century. And then second would be Richard Wright's Black Boy. But he also has another novel called The Long Dream, which I think is his best. And uh, the reason Richard Wright is so important is because Richard Wright, his existence spans the two versions of the United States, right? So the Civil War, uh, theorists call that the second founding of the U.S. So, so he lived through, he lived through that transition. His his grandmother and his grandfather were emancipated people. Okay. He grew up in Natchez, Mississippi. So he grew up in the '40s and the '50s with people who had experienced slavery. First hand. So he yes, saw, right. he got to saw, see both sides right, of, right. Of, of the American experience. So, and he is the first uh, African American author to earn his entire living from writing. He is, he <laughs> is, yeah, he is, he is the progenitor of everything that is African American literature from World War II forward. Everybody owes everything to write. This is a completely already a completely different podcast because normally it starts off with, you know, there, somebody blew up something in the toilet. The basketball team won by fifty. Um, I want to so I want to uh, dive a little deeper because I'm very interested in this question. I had to read some Baldwin, I think, in college, but uh, yeah, that, that's a long time ago. I mean, I I don't do very much reading now. But the other author you're referring to, and how he grew up in Mississippi at that time frame. I'm curious as to your perspective on this question. Was the African-American community more prosperous during that time as a, to, in terms of like black businesses, black owned businesses, black, or was Jim Crow so oppressive that there was no chance for any type of gain, profit, success? What, what, is, what does the yes, author say about yes it? And yes, yes okay. and yes because of the Jim Crow system, which was economic, political, social, spiritual, because of that system, and that system began in the, in the late 1850s and ran all the way through the late 1960s through 65. Uh, like I tell my students, I put it to them in, in, in terms of this particular frame, right? So the first Africans in bondage arrived on the North American continent in 1619, which predates the Republic because the Republic doesn't become a Republic until 1781, right? So from 1619 to 1863, you have constitutionally sanctioned, legally uh, enforced enslavement, right? Then so from I would I would say two, it's two different types of uh, in, enforcement. It, the pre-republic, pre-founding, right. there is a European. It's almost like status quo as opposed to. In other words, it was legal within the European states that brought it to the to the North American continent. Right. Then, so then, then it you was have under it. British colonial rule. So in, in British colonial rule, it was, was the rule in the colonies in that period. So from 1865, which is the end of the Civil War, until 1965, which is the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act. So essentially what you have is a group of people either in bondage. Hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're telling something I, is very fascinating to me, but I'm already getting the Facebook post. Freddie Tomasello says, uh, Kevin, hello, Kevin, you were the greatest trash talker in Bayshore history. <laughs> and uh, Freddie also says, love the beard. So we're not, we're not going to be able to escape the comedy, but please keep going on this subject because I'm okay. very- Okay, so to wrap it all up, right? So 
what we're talking about is from 1619 to 1865, essentially about 286 years of bondage or de facto bondage. In order for the group of people that look like me that share my DNA to be out of or even with that existence, it would have to go from 1965, 286 years forward for us to just get back to an even point where we've spent as much time out of as we did in. So how does that inform the diaspora? Well, the diaspora in terms of the African-American literary diaspora, once you understand that, and once you understand that there's really only one person who has had one foot in both worlds, you have to come back to Richard Wright. He's the only one. That's really good stuff. I'm gonna, after this, I want you to text me some uh, recommend, recommended reading. And uh, I've already learned a new word because I used to think it was diaspora and you're mm -hmm. saying diaspora. <laughs> So no, that's, um, that's really fascinating, really great. And thank you for sharing it. I learned to look, hope to learn more from you about it. Let's uh, ask this question. Tell us what you remember <laughs> when uh, we met uh, in uh, church. Yeah. I think Oak Haven Baptist Church. Oak Haven Baptist, Baptist Church. Yeah. yeah. The, rode the buses, did Sunday school together. Do you remember when we met? Uh, and what is the funniest story you remember? I know there's one story that you're going to blame on me, which is um, not my wait, 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 you mean uh, the Walt Disney World trip <laughs> where we went to uh, Walt Disney jail? Hey, was, yeah, yeah. And, and you got us in trouble, not me. Oh, so you wanted to get off of, what was the name of that ride? It was, it was like an asteroid ride, some new ride yeah. they had. And you decided that we were going to get off and as soon as we stepped foot out of that car, they were all on us and it was crazy. And then your dad, I'll never forget the face, your, your dad's face when he came and found, I don't even know how the Disney people found your dad, but That's they did. That's a good point. I mean. <laughs> Cause it was like in the 1980s, not like they had cell phones and, and GPS trackers. Yeah, they, and what I, remember, I, what I remember is completely different. I remember trying to egg you into doing it and you jumped out. Uh, I followed you. So okay, yeah, all right, all right. Yeah, that PTSD that you're suffering from is changing, <laughs> changing yeah. the order of events. Yeah, without question. I mean, so Oak Haven uh, Baptist Church Youth Group, we get uh, Disney policed. How, how we're still alive. I mean, my father literally executed everything in his path. So how, <laughs> how we're still alive, I don't know. Uh, it's probably because there would have been too many witnesses at this. That's the only, the only reason. Um, Freddie Tomasello is, is urging us to skip all this perfunctory stuff and get right to when you jumped on somebody's back at camp and punched him out. Uh, what? You came off the bench, jumped on the back of the guy who took out his brother and punched him out. Uh, so, these stories get more and more outlandish every single year with age, Freddie. Really? Okay. So uh, first of all, let's let's go back to camp. Yes. Yes. Because at camp is when come on my mellows comes on. Okay. So when we went to University of Florida camp, we were there with the best teams in the state. Oh, yeah. of Florida. And, and wait, let me let me set the stage for people who are watching. Kevin Daniels is part of the 1987 Bayshore Christian State Final Four team, one of only two teams to actually play in the state championship game, the team that came the closest to winning it, only losing by five points. This is largely considered the greatest team in school history and one of the greatest teams in Hillsborough County history. You're at Bayshore Christian with your friends, your brother Kelvin, Chris Pate, Fred Tomasello. This is late 80s, Herman Valdez, Bayshore domination. And this is the summer before your senior year, the team goes to Florida Gator camp. So you go ahead. So we were there with teams like Miami Senior. We were there with Miami Hialeah, Lakeland Kathleen. I mean, Jacksonville Reball. I mean, we were there with the best teams in the state. And we were playing four or five games a day, all day for seven days straight. So. Of course, it got a little competitive. Now, Kelvin wasn't there. He right. was at a camp in Louisiana 
come to find out he broke a backboard at that camp. <laughs> and the news came all the way back to Gainesville, Florida. But I think the reason we were so successful as a team in 87 was because of that Florida camp, because we played against the absolute best. And I think because of my uh, very outgoing personality, <laughs> my, uh, no, no, no. and my, uh, my uh, willingness to accept challenges, perhaps challenges that are a little bit bigger than I'm ready to handle, I think the, the personality of the team was formed, bonded in that particular space for that week to where they kind of learned how to play against guys like Lakeland Kathleen, Frost Proof, uh, Miami Senior. My, and I think they those teams actually kind of, you know, they looked at us as a bunch of little whatevers when we showed up, but we showed up and we played and then you had somebody like me who was not afraid of anybody under any circumstances. And I think that particular experience was the experience that made us bond as a team and, and get us ready to make the run that we made. Because we, I mean, by the end of the week, we weren't afraid of anybody. That was not the case when we got there. That, that is all true. Uh, it is a very professor professorial, historical way of sharing the uh, the uh, moment in time at this Gator camp. Um, let's get to the nitty gritty because Fred is telling the truth. There was a game, I thought it was against Rebalt. Fred is saying Miami senior, Jose Ramos is their point guard. Cesar Portillo went to University of Florida. You guys are playing them and there's some type of shoving, foul, pushing situation, which leads to a brawl and you... I know the story. You started throwing punches at Jose Ramos, who would go on to play Division I basketball. You were literally standing amongst the players going, come on, my fellows. You were willing to take on everyone there. Uh, again, I don't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in that gym, uh, it was just like playing at the park. I mean, you know, right. everybody talks trash and people get a little heated. And you know, you either gonna step up or you're gonna get punked out. And I was not gonna get punked out. So, you know, and it's interesting, Freddie and, and Chris Pate remember all of these uh these these altercations with me. I would simply ask them, where were they when I was taking on the whole <laughs> Miami senior team? How is shouldn't that question be answered? I'm not here by myself. Well, surely they were there, right? I mean, the the the, the crux of the story, as uh -huh. her, as Coach Valdez remembers, is that as things are breaking out, you are taking on everyone, just like this. Come on, like taking on, like ready to take on everyone. Where Pate and Fred is, Fred are, is a very good question. Uh, I'm sure that Freddie was there. Pate had to be there, right? Uh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> was Donnie Hamlin there? I mean, I don't no, they, you know. No, a lot of them guys, they just kind of faded into into the uh to the background and, and uh kind of let me uh let me run the show as <laughs> it And you did run the show. Now I got a couple more comments on Facebook before I get to them. Uh what what happened thinking and maybe we can't remember because I can't remember anything. Thinking back to then, was there any other comical moments in the dorm room, getting dinner. Oh, uh, there were several, several things. I'm not sure we should we should preserve in internet history. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't there a way to describe them without using any type of profane or demeaning I'm think, names? I'm trying to think what 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 stood out the most. I know I shared a room with Jeff Cook. Uh, <laughs> I had. Friends from Tampa who were actually attending University of Florida, two, two young ladies that I knew that were attending University of Florida. I think I hung out with them a couple of times. Were you allowed or did you have to sneak around to I be able to sneak out to, to hang out with them? 
you know, 17, the summer before yeah. your senior year, you think that you, you know, you think that you, you're next level, you're really not. You're a high school senior. So that was cool. Uh, I'm trying to think. I know everybody got mad at Noriega and and Doug Drury for something. I just don't remember what it was. Uh, Poor Doug Drury, yeah. It was a it was a good week. It was a long week. Uh, again, I think that was the week that we that we learned how to compete. I don't think we would have went as far as we did without that week. I really don't. Very interesting. I mean, and a lot of Bayshore uh, teams uh, have faced, have gone to that Gator camp and, the and well, I mean, back then, Bayshore every single year had a good team. And what, one of the reasons is what you're saying, facing that type of street ball, bigger athlete, public school challenge, no restrictions on combat uh, made you a better team. And I think that's totally true. On Facebook right now, John Harville, one of the original gangsters, came before us uh, saying the same back in 1983. This is nothing new from Bayshore, exclamation point, talking about the uh, fighting the, the, the riot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's really good. Fred is desperate for us to now get to the state championship talk. I don't, I don't want to get there yet, Fred, so you have to keep watching. Uh, because that was, we described this episode as the five greatest min minutes in state championship basketball history. So we don't want to get there yet. Uh, let's talk about how you and your, I mean, we've covered on your brother's episode, how I, I was talking him into going to Bay, Bay Shore, which meant both of you from the year before. I mean, I used to be, hang out at your house. I ate your mama's cooking. We played at the park. So we were together for years. Um, now you're at Bay Shore. Was it culture shock? Uh, what was it like being in the, such a small environment, Christian environment? Tell us about the fall of the 86, 87 school year, your senior year, what's going on there for you? Uh, I think the, the culture shock was not necessarily in terms of the diversity ratios because okay. Andre was there and then there were two other young ladies that were there and some of the younger kids were there and it was Tampa in the eighties. So I think the biggest thing making the transition from public school to Bayshore Christian was probably just leaving everybody we knew behind. Right. Uh, it was, the transition was in terms of its, its, its difficulty was lessened because we didn't have to make new friends. We had Freddie, we had Chris Pate. Chris Pate went to Armwood as well. And we were universally accepted. And I think Coach Valdez started us uh, unofficially working out in right. September. Right. We were running Bayshore, yes. Bayshore Boulevard every day for like miles. And uh, yeah, so w w the teachers were kind of hit and miss with me. I remember the Bible teacher was not very fond of me. Who was your Bible teacher? I forget her name, but she was Mrs. not very Jordan? fond of me. Mrs. Huh? Jordan? Mrs. Jordan? I may have been. Okay, but yeah. That changed. I, I charmed her and that changed after a little while. So. <laughs> Mrs. Jordan, if you're watching, I want to know if uh, Kevin Daniels' charm is what uh, made things go smoothly that senior year in Bible class. I think it was. I think it was. Uh, there have been great pictures in the yearbook from that year. Yeah. One is with you, and uh, I think her name is Kim Say, S E A Y is the last name, reading a book together. Uh, there's another great picture of you with, with Coach Dibble, and your shirt is unbuttoned all the way down. And the caption under it says, I swear, Coach Dibble, Miss Jordan is blind as a bat. My shirt was not untucked or, un, or unbuttoned or something like that. I think uh, that was our last week in school before graduation. Okay. So, yeah, things got a little loose that, that last week. That senioritis was was uh, flaring up pretty bad because right. there's no way we'd have done that during the regular year. Right, right. No, Herman, Herman would not have. Yeah, he would not have tolerated that for half a second. 
So yeah, and so you have Miss Jordan Bible. What what are some of the other? So fall, this is you're running Bayshore, getting ready to get into some Herman, some basketball. Before we do that, any other memories from the preseason uh, that was funny, unique? Uh, it, it's certainly a culture shock, but not as bad as you said. And it's very important to point out, uh, Bayshore. You think about you know the 1980s, 1970s, and diversity. Bayshore was the first uh, Christian school to have a female. Uh, principal. We had African Americans uh, that were graduating in the 70s, like two or three in a class of 15. Yeah. Uh, so there was it was certainly at Bayshore, maybe not at every every private school. Oh, in the definitely 80s. not at Tampa Catholic. You oh, yeah. How, how racist they were. Yeah. But, but Bayshore had a did a great job at inclusive inclusion, inclusive uh, relationships between staff, kids. And I thought that that's shown through uh, throughout the years, you know, before yeah. there and after. But anyways, go, getting back to you, right preseason, any other funny stories or teachers that you remember? I'm, I'm thinking hard. Uh, funny story. I mean, it was, it, Coach, Coach Valdez was, uh, very straightforward in his in his thinking and his communication with us. So <laughs> uh, I love him to death. I can't think of anything in particular. Maybe Freddie can jog my memory, but I do remember that we were doing lots and lots of running, conditioning at the beginning of the year down Bayshore Boulevard, which was probably funny in it itself, seeing a bunch of 16-year-old boys of various backgrounds running up and down that very, very high-end boulevard yes. in Tampa on, you know, Monday and Tuesday afternoons and Wednesday and Thursdays. So that is for sure. That is for sure. So let, let's go then into the season. I mean, y'all start off uh, 10 and 0. You beat in a matter of seven days, you beat Plant, Robinson, and Jefferson. We've covered that a lot in previous episodes. We're, we're all very curious about a few things. One, uh, playing time, because clearly, so time to call Herman on the phone. Herman, I should have played more. We'd have, we'd have won the state title. Talk, talk to me about playing time, and also talk to me. Everyone wants to hear the story when you played the Swedish national team. <laughs> You come off the bench and create an international incident. Tell us a little bit about those things as we lead in 10 and 0 into Christmas. So playing time, uh, there were certain situations where I got to play a lot. So when we were playing schools like Frost, Frostproof and Plant and Robinson, I played a lot more yes. uh, in, in the four kind of three position uh, those games were kind of suited to my skill set, and that's what coach told me. Uh, you had to be a little, you had to be a little tougher under that basket with those guys, otherwise they'll they'll eat you alive. Uh, in terms of that Swedish national game, uh, that was kind of bizarre because I think on the play before that, and and think about this, we're a high school team in Tampa, Florida playing a Swedish national team, right? And beating them. Yeah. And, I, and that team Swedish was all white and blonde hair. Well, I mean, you didn't, you, you, that was our first loss. So we were ahead we were the game. Them. Yeah, we were beating them. And, it was like, you said, this, game. like you said, they were 19 and under. This, yeah. is a, this is not like all high school, I mean, these are men. Yeah, and they're traveling around the world playing basketball as a team for God knows how long. And we had been together for a few months. Right. So, so anyway, uh, we one of them undercut Kelvin. And the one that undercut Kelvin, uh, I ended up guarding him on an inbound pass. So he was standing, the two of us were standing, it, it was a baseline under the basket, inbound pass. He throws his hands up. He takes off running. I'm right behind him. He gets a step on me, and he goes up for a layoff. So I give him a little push. Just a little. Just, just a little. little. Just a little push. 
<laughs> he, gets all, he, he does the, the English Premier League flop you know, into, into the, onto the floor and acting like, you know, I, I picked him up and slammed him to the ground. The crowd was all into it because what was the name of that school? St. Pete, whatever. We oh, had it was, uh, huh? it was it was it was Keswick, St. Pete Keswick Christian. Yeah, and we had and beaten they, them like five times. It was well, yeah, and not just that, they pretend their arrival, but we had beaten them 39 out of 41 times from 1982 to 1995. So you were just continuing the humiliations. But I but it I was remember. their tournament as well. Yeah. Yes. So they all jump on the crowd, jumps on the Swedish national team side yes. and starts screaming at us. And I'm like, really? Really? This is basketball. Really? You, you, you're cheering for a team that probably doesn't even speak fluent English against yes. us because we've beaten y'all so many times. And of course, it's me. So Whatever. I mean, you know, you undercut my brother. I'm going to come after you. That's, 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 right. that's playground rules. That's how it goes. That, that playground rules. That's exactly right. Sadie Park and Brandon. Uh, although I think you're understating the degree of the foul. As this kid goes flying into the stage or whatever, the wall, whatever they have. Oh, oh man. I, I'll need to see the video. I don't, I don't remember <laughs> I need to see the video replay. See I, didn't, I don't remember that happening that way. I just gave him a little nudge a to little remind bit. him and his 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 Swedish compatriots, you're not going to come in here and take out my brother and then not be a response. There's going to be a response. Now, I may not punch you in the face, but the next time I get a chance, I'm going to take it. And that's, I took it. That's exactly right. And, and like you said, street rules, uh, that, that's Bayshore rules. I mean, the Bayshore teams of the 80s, whether they had talent or not, won, they won when they walked in the gym through intimidation. Right. Because it was going to be, if, if we, we were going to fall behind, there was going to be a fight. So uh, that was the way it was. Yeah, like they used to say it at my brother when he went to Hillsborough and he played at Hillsborough, you know, we're going to win the game or we're going to win the fight, but we're going to win. So. <laughs> that's right. That's excellent. Uh, yeah. got a few uh, posts online again. Freddie Tomasello says, very physical. Kevin would hammer guys not even trying to get the ball. Uh, that's really, that's street rules right there. And then uh, Jeff Hamilton, no doubt Kevin could talk trash. He was the enforcer. Lots of laughs, laughs off the court. Turned it up a notch on the court. Do you have any famous Jeff Hamilton uh, stories? He's a brand, He's another Brandon boy. I don't. I don't. I haven't seen or talked to Jeff in 30 years. My goodness. Hello, Jeff. How are you? That's really yeah, nice. that's, that, that was part of the game in the 80s. And I think that transcended not just park ball, but all the way up to the NBA. I mean, when you think about yes. the, the bad boys from Detroit, you think about Jordan, you think about the Knicks. I mean, you know, that it was a physical game back then. And I was talking to Freddie last time I saw him and talked to him and I was talking about the state game and, I, and, 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 it, and it dawned upon me. I was like, we put up 83 points without a three-point line. Yes. That is unheard of. I mean, we were running and gunning. I mean, we were up and down the court and it didn't matter where you shot the ball from. If it went in, it was two. So to put up 80 points, and what were we doing, like eight-minute quarters or 10-minute quarters? Yeah, eight-minute quarters, and you scored 38 points in the fourth quarter, which remains the most points in a single quarter in a state playoff game, any classification ever. It remains the record. My goodness, we scored 38 points in fourth quarter? Yeah, it was, a, it was a wonderful comeback, and it was all spurred by your efforts. And we're going to get there as we're moving along. We've got – the Swedish national riot, which leads to an international incident. Uh, we've got um, running Bayshore. We got street rules. And we're now in the second half of the season, January, February. Um, well, let me say something about that yeah, yeah. Swedish game. Coach Valdez never made me feel bad about that. That's never. Right. 
never once did he, I mean, even after the game, I was hanging my head. He was like, hey man, forget about it. Let's go on to the next one. And uh, I think our team took on his personality. I wouldn't say that he would condone such a thing, but I don't <laughs> think he was all that upset about it. I really don't, because coach, 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 coach is coach, right? Yeah. If you know Coach Valdez, you know Coach is coach, right? Exactly. So, but anyway, let's move on from from Sweden. Wait, well, I just want to re echo what you just said, Coach Valdez, our coach, who we who I love, and I know we all love more than anything. There is an ethos about what he was all about. Uh, not only did he, so, so there's this persona, like that he's screaming and yelling, you got to run. It's like a hit, you know, he's, he's threatening us if we don't run all that sort of stuff, but there is a love for his players and he's in the arena with you. There's yep. a famous story when he first started coaching at Robinson, there was a fight where a guy came out of the stands with a knife, whatever his dad who could barely speak English comes down to defend him with a scissors from his barber shop. And Herman's like, dad, dad, what are you doing? Put that away. Get up in the stands. And he's like, I'm coming to defend you. The point being the, 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 the physicality of Bay shore during the eighties, which as you said, was the nature of basketball, but we certainly played to it. Yes. And our coach and our coach always defended us. Yep. And uh, that's, that's really great to feel when you get to go compete and knowing your coach is uh, with you all the way. Yeah, because I think if, if, if that would have happened with a different coach, they probably would have kicked me off the team. Right, right. especially today. I mean, today yeah. it's completely different. So but, I totally agree with you. Yeah, uh, not coach. Coach was like, let's move on. Let's go. Yeah, he's, such a, he's such a great teacher. Yeah, he, 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 he is. Love him to death. So on to Freddie's, because I guess Freddie is running the agenda here. So what's, oh, wait, what's no, no. <laughs> We're not going to let Fred run the agenda. Hold on, hold on. So we go to the second half of the season. I want to talk about one, two things. One, the opponents that you had to play a second time, like district opponents home and away, they're getting closer because they're starting to like four corners and stall ball and that sort of thing. And I want to know your perspective on that. Were y'all ever worried? Was there a game you're worried? And then the second question I have for you, and you can cover them both in, in whatever order. We went to plant the second time and lost at their place. Your brother was fouled out in the third quarter. Four guys fouled out. Everybody feels like it was a home job from the refs. I want your perspective on those two questions, how our opponents were getting closer the second time we played them and what happened at plant. Please, please share with us. So we, we figured out pretty early. I, I think it was a game in some school, I think in Lakeland where they were trying every dirty trick in the book. I mean, they were grabbing us as we went up for rebounds. They would, uh, they would deliberately try and bait us into fouls. I think the referees were, were keenly aware of what they were doing and not calling it on purpose. When we walked in the gym, you, you could feel it. It was probable that everybody in that gym was against us. Any away game, everybody. Did you, did you feel, so did, what was your opinion at that time, your feelings? Was it because we were from Tampa? Was it because we were good or was it because we were a diverse lineup? What was your feeling? I think it was all three. Okay. Because even back then, Tampa was a big, small city. So okay. everybody knew who we were, where we came from, the whole nine. And I think there was a lot of jealousy and animosity toward us because they had to figure out a reason why we were beating them other than the fact that we were better than them and that we were beating them because we were better than them. So they came up with all of these narratives and the narrative sunk in and they acted accordingly when we walked into the gym. So, you know, many times, many times those referees would say little stuff to me when I was out on the court. And I'm sure they probably said stuff to Kelvin and Andre. Uh, that, was, that was inappropriate and, and borderline racist, but I ignored it most of the time. I actually ignored it all the time because all you had to do is look up the scoreboard and we were kicking their ass. So you can say whatever you want, we're leaving with the W. So, uh, yeah, they would do that because out of fear, 
they couldn't beat us. No matter what they did, they couldn't beat us. Even if you did four corners, guess what? You're going to have to shoot eventually. We're going to get the ball. We're going to take it down the court, put it through the hoop. And if you want to play that press game, we can play that too. Oh, yeah. You know, what, what you just mentioned about the scoreboard, one of the great things about your senior year and about Bayshore through the 80s and probably the mid-90s was the crowd. And every time the opponent's crowd would be happy about anything, the Bayshore crowd would go, scoreboard, yes. scoreboard. Yep. And it yep. was just, it's glorious to the ears when you when you hear it and think back to it. So that's really, yeah. really cool. Um, so scores are getting closer, but we're still winning. It's, they're trying different strategies to try to match up, and they just don't match up. Um, tell us about that plant game. The game at plant had a big crowd, a um, lot of foul outs. Seems like they're getting even for losing to us over at Bayshore. What are your thoughts? I think that I think that that particular game was the result of the Tampa Tribune write up on Kelvin. I think he had been player of the week for like an entire month or so. <laughs> and, uh, Plant and Robinson had particular uh, affinity for Coach Valdez from his time there. So everybody was invested in making sure that we lost. And we did. But again, we all knew what it was. Kelvin was not anybody that fouled. He got fouled a lot, but he wasn't anybody that fouled out. I fouled out once or twice, but it, it certainly wasn't Kelvin. It wasn't Freddie. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was a, it was a ridiculous display of, of jealousy and, and complicitness between the refs and the team that we were playing and the fans, I mean, they wanted us to lose. They made up their mind that we were going to lose before we ever walked in the door. The good thing about it is I don't think we even cared. We just played the game, got on the bus, went home, and went and won the next 20. So, <laughs> well, you know, uh, Mike Blocker, you know, rested so we, we lost him here recently with the COVID, and we certainly send out our condolences like we always do when we speak about him to his family and friends. Uh, Mike Blocker always says this. Mike Blocker always says that, you know, you, whether it's – if you have to play five on seven or five on eight because of the refs, what are you going to do? Go home, you just got to play. But that was a one time – he said that was a one time where I felt there was no way we were going to be allowed to win this game. So, yeah. I mean, that's how we bad it was. That. We kind of knew that. And maybe in our naivete, because we had been up against, especially that one guy, there was this one ref that used to come to Bayshore, he would show up every three or four games. I swear this guy hated us. We did <laughs> not get one single call from this guy. And I think he might have been a Tampa Catholic guy or whatever he was, but he made sure that we got zero calls, zero. I mean, somebody could have ran up and, and, and punched us in the face and they probably would have called a foul on us, on our face, hitting yeah. him fist but uh I don't think that ever deterred us because again we knew we were going to run everybody out of the gym so you know the ref's not shooting right. he's calling he's calling fouls right but he can't call a foul on a three-on-one break and we and Kelvin dunks it on your head so what are you going to call a foul on that for can't call a foul on a 20-foot jumper that that Freddie drains you know, in some guy's face, you can't call a foul on me getting rebounds. I mean, you can, but again, you're still going to have to go up and down that court with us eventually. Right, right. So that, that's such a great answer. We're uh, now at the end of the season. Uh, we, there's so many interesting games. I mean, we win the district by triple overtime against a team we beat by 40 twice. Uh, we've talked about that before. Chris Pate scored three points, which we won by three. So he always claimed responsibility for the victory. Uh, so Chris, <laughs> if you're watching, we want to repeat that again. Uh, you beat uh, Keswick. They tried to four corner you again, the St. Pete school, but you handled them pretty much roll through the um, Moore Haven. I don't know if you want to talk about that, but Moore Haven, we've talked about a lot. It was a sellout crowd. Everybody in Brandon and Tampa, because most everybody had lost. Like yeah. there's no Tampa teams left other than I think Tampa Bay Tech. 
Yep. Right. So everybody came to watch you guys. And that, that gym was packed out. And uh, I remember I've said it before, More Haven's bus rolls on the campus. It's got Christmas lights lit up in the bus and you can hear them chant More Haven, More Haven as they're rolling yeah. up. But you guys took care of them uh, in a ran great way. Yep. Yeah, ran them out of the gym. And so that takes us to the greatest five minutes anyone has ever witnessed in basketball. We, <laughs> we encourage people to go watch it. It's on the YouTube page, the state championship game against Hawthorne. Number one, Hawthorne, which has Wendell Jenkins, who would go to University of Florida, and uh, Bayshore Christians ranked number two. Um, we're, getting our, we're getting our butts kicked <clears throat> pretty good for most of that game. And Coach Valdez turns to you at the start of the fourth quarter, and you make your move which entirely flips the script of the game. Tell us about what happened there in that fourth quarter against Hawthorne. So I'm sitting there and they're pressing us. And we've been pressed before. For some strange reason, we just weren't playing our game. And coach had given us a very detailed, methodical game plan against these guys. And I don't know if anybody knows this, but one of our wins was a forfeit against them because they were supposed to play us oh, regular season. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't come. It was supposed to be in Tampa at Bayshore. They forfeited that game. I, news here. I don't remember that at all. I saw them was the state championship game, but that's, that's an aside. So I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, you know, this is no different from what we've been doing all year this 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 is a street ball game let me get out there and remind everybody who we are let me try to get everybody back on track i mean because it seemed like we were demoralized and 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 had pretty much given up so i get in there and i go to to window first i said <laughs> I'm here now. It's just about to change. He kind of laughed at me. I was like, okay, we'll see. And then uh, I think after a couple of times up and down the court, we just kind of threw the game plan out and just played straight yeah. street ball. That's and exactly what happened. That's the thing that got us back into the game. And, you know, I was, I was playing a few mind games with those guys because uh, – <laughs> We know we had to get them out of their rhythm. And uh, eventually, Kelvin and Freddie, they started playing like we used to play. Freer. Part up in Brandon. Just play free. You know what? We're down, what were we down, 20 at some point? You were down 19 going into the fourth quarter. Okay, what do we got to lose? Let's go play. Let's play our game. Let's go at these boys. And that's what we did. Now, I got a lot of fouls as a result because, again, I was trying to get in their faces. Yeah, you were you were very face. physical, very yeah, physical. Well, I mean, that's what they were physical with us. Yes. We just didn't respond. Yes. And there's a there's a pivotal sequence. And I, I really encourage people to just go to watch it on YouTube and like fast forward to the end of the game and watch the, the sequence where you come into you come in. Well, you were probably already in the game. There's an inbounds play. I want to say it was boxed or something where you catch it underneath, score, get fouled, and one. They come down, and we're pressing, so it's a transition play. It's like a three-on-two, two-on-one. You slam the guy against the backboard, no foul call, get the rebound, outlet. We go down. I don't remember if it's a shot or a pass, but you get the ball again near the basket, score, foul, and one which literally a six point swing in a matter of 30 seconds and you punch your fist into the air. And what was really cool about this moment, really cool. The Miami senior crowd, the Lakeland civic center, the one a game is before the four a game. Yep. The mass number of tickets that are sold are from Miami. They're largely not caring, but when you entered the game, the whole crowd of the Lakeland 7,500 starts cheering for Bayshore and specifically the plays you were making. And it's just some amazing noise to hear when you're watching it. Do you remember that sequence of score foul block pinned against the backboard and score again? 
Not before you just mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely do not. Because was I was in a zone. You know, when you're on the court, you don't hear anything that's not within that those four corners of the game. And the only people you can hear are your teammates. You can hear the coach. You can hear the other guys you're playing against. But you don't hear or see. You're not aware of everything that's going on in the gym because you're so focused on that. I do remember some some the thing I remember was uh, was meeting him in the middle of the court, and he tried to do his little you know uh, between the legs behind the pack little dribble thing. Uh, I don't know if I stole it for him or yeah, you stole it. Okay, I, I've, I've watched this game several times since we were able to you know when COVID hit and we did all of this and we were able to collect the videos. I mean, you're sitting around in lockdown. I've watched this game a lot. You did steal it from Wendell Jenkins. And yeah. before you keep, wait, before you keep going, Freddie Tomasello says, <laughs> this is, he says, here is the uh, non-profane version. Uh, Kevin came into the game saying, you done, you had your sweet potato pie. It's on <laughs> now, my brothers. It's on now. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently you told Jenkins, it is on now. Yeah, I did. I told him it's on now. I mean, it's it's, it's a new ball game. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. I'm going to show you, show you what we're really about in about two seconds here. So yeah, that's the, that's the, the, the part of the game that most stands out is, he was trying to poster me up, trying to make me look bad. I mean, in front of the entire arena, it was just me and him in the middle of the court. And I was like, okay, all right, I'm watching him. And he does that over the front and I'm taking off and I'm going. And I think that got in his head because I don't think that probably ever happened to him before. Probably not, yeah. I think those guys were at the Florida camp with us. And the, the thing about it is like Portillo and all those guys, they did the same thing to us, right? <laughs> we didn't back down at Florida camp. And, and you got to remember at Florida camp, there wasn't a whole lot of refereeing going on. No, I mean, you've, no. got, you've got four or five games going on at the same time. You've got the University of Florida basketball staff you know they're working. You got and, some. You got some grad assistant. Yeah, I mean they're like your girlfriend. Yeah. Let you do whatever. It's street yeah, ball. Let's, let's street play. Ball. It was yeah. straight street ball, and uh, I don't think that ever happened to him. And I think that kind of changed the course of the game because he was their mental, spiritual, physical leader on the court. And I think when they saw that, I think that kind of turned things, the momentum in our favor. Without a doubt. And, and uh, just to summarize that whole thing, I mean, this, this is clearly the greatest five minutes in Florida high school basketball history by a performance. Nah, of the player. Oh yeah. No, no. Um, score, foul, steal, block, unbelievable. But it, it, we come up short. We, we got it down to three and we're on the foul line with a one and one and we don't convert the front end. And that was probably the last gasp. I think you fouled out right before that. Yep. Um, but what a what an I mean, what an iconic moment for Bayshore Christian. It it clearly of all the state title games, Bayshore's only played in two state title games, been to eight final fours, but only played in the title game twice. And we we've always lost to the eventual champion, but no one ever went toe-to-toe -to -toe with what would be the champion like you guys did. I mean, it was clearly one of the great basketball games in FHSA history. And uh, we're so thankful that uh, your performance contributed to it. Did my best, man. Left it all out there on the court. You got to leave it on the court. That is awesome. So we've, we've gotten through the, the stuff that Freddie told us we had to get through. We've done yeah. what Freddie has said. Uh, we're now at the end of basketball season. And uh, again, to repeat, the, the greatest team in school history, one of the greatest in Hillsborough County history, 34 and three, seven wins against public schools, 10 wins against higher classification, no loss in class 1A until you got to the championship game. And you went toe to toe with, you know, you went toe to toe with Ali, George Foreman, Frazier, and you yeah. were right there to the end. Um, as school year's winding up, I think you played baseball. Tell I did. us a little bit about that. And uh, what was that like? You played with Pate, Tomasello. What was that like? Hamilton? 
I, I just wanted to do something, man, because, you know, you, you're still on that high and, you know, you, you take off the uniform at the end of the year and you kind of wish it's not over, but it is. And uh, played baseball, always wanted to play baseball. I don't think I played every game. I think I played maybe four or five games. Uh, it was fun. It was, it was good to be around the guys. It wasn't basketball. It wasn't the same group of guys. We weren't as good as the basketball team, but, you know, I enjoyed the experience of playing basketball, uh, baseball, and I got to, you know, get in another team photo in the yearbook. <laughs> <laughs> did, did we have, did we have track or soccer? Did you do anything else? No, remember, uh, I think uh, Jeff Cook played soccer at the beginning yeah. of the year, I think. Yeah. Uh, but no, we didn't have track. Uh, because remember, what, what month was the championship game? March. Yeah, so it was the end of March, wasn't it? I know, I think early, I mean, I think like second week, March 10th. Somewhere yeah, so it wasn't much time after that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, you've got spring break, and then April is pretty much finals, and then May, and you do grad. What was that, that thing at Disney? Grad was night. Disney? Grad yeah. night. Yeah, you do that and, and you know, you're pretty much done. So it any, flew any by stories, really fast. Huh? Any stories from grad night? No, my uh, my girlfriend who was in college at the time. Of course. <laughs> she, she, she was at Florida a and She came down and she went with us to grad night. I remember us riding the bus to Orlando. And I remember uh, seeing Ready for the World, the Jerry, Jerry Curl kings of the universe at the time. Uh, I remember seeing Bobby Brown. Oh, I mean, really? yeah, it was, it was a great, great, great yeah. night. Yeah, they don't do that kind of thing in Texas. So they still do it in Florida, right? I, I don't know, actually. I'm in Georgia, so I don't know. Okay. Yeah, that was, that, was, that was a memorable evening. It really was. Very I good. Think Kelvin and Freddie then were all stag. I think they were hanging out with each other. <laughs> did Kelvin? Did Kelvin ever have a girlfriend in high in senior year? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know Fred was dating my sister. Who did Pate date? His senior uh, year. Anybody who accepted his, uh, <laughs> his invitation. <laughs> That is great. Pate was in love with that one girl. Who's that girl that Pate was in love with? I forget her name. He was. If you ask him, I'm sure he'll tell you. Well, but, I know Patterson was with uh, Tawny Thornton. I want to say, uh, but yeah, I don't remember Pate. Um, so, who? Get, so we're we're near the end here, and we can't thank you enough for your time that you've shared with me. I'm I really appreciate it because. You're my brother, and I ain't seen you in a long time. No, so man. I'm hoping to get out to Houston like we talked about here pretty soon. Absolutely. Um, tell us, uh, give us some shout outs. Any uh, non basketball people that hasn't been mentioned yet that you remember? Uh, tell us your favorite teacher, classroom moment, like, you know, who, who that might be. I mean, you, you mentioned Miss Jordan, you charmed her. Uh, you certainly got out of Mr. Mr. Dibble, probably as Dean. Uh, you probably avoided lots of problems there. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your school experience beyond My what favorite we're... teacher was the English teacher. What was uh, Wynett. Mrs. Wine? Mrs. Wine, favorite teacher by all means. Love Miss Wine. She's probably the reason I was an English major. Uh, so cool. You're not the only somebody else said Miss Wine inspired them for their yeah. whatever, you know, English, whatever it was. So that's yep. really cool how she reached you guys. That's really great. Yep. Yep. And uh, as far as everybody else, they're kind of a blur. Uh, I remember the advanced biology teacher. I don't remember her name. I remember the look on her face every time I walked in that classroom. <laughs> uh, was it Van Glenn? Mrs. Van Glenn? I think that was her name, Van yeah. Glenn. Yeah. And uh, of course, Coach Dibble, Coach Valdez. I mean, you know, those guys always have a special place, especially Coach Dibble. Yeah, you have to have a Dibble story, I mean, because that's prominently in the in the uh, yearbook, pictures with you and Dibble. Yeah, he and I were very, very, very close. And I, I kind of miss him. Not, not kind of, I actually do. So Coach, if you're listening, hey, how you doing? 
give me a call, look me up. I'm not on Facebook. I don't do social media. It is absolute trash. But uh, <laughs> get my number from Steve or Freddie or anybody. Yeah, I'll, else. I'll get. Yeah, I'll give you yeah. all. I'll give the numbers yeah. to each other. Yeah, and uh, Dibble don't do social media either, so I'll, I'll connect yeah. you. Yeah, I think I think uh, one of the good things that came out of that time was was Andre. Andre was a tenth grader at the time. Andre was a little unsure of himself at the beginning. But I think by the end of that year with me and Kelvin, I think Andre uh, made some strides forward. He is a immensely successful young man right now. And if anybody doesn't know, just 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 call him and ask him. <laughs> hey, Andre, Andre, Steve, yeah, I mean, what you just said is all exactly true. Andre Stevenson arrived not as, not as a basketball player. He was an academic, and he yeah. was an academic star. He he was more intellectually gifted than probably any of us combined. Yep. Uh, your uh, brother and you teaching him the ways of the game of basketball, being a teammate, made him much better so that he was a great contributor to basketball. But forget basketball. The guy is like the senior international director for Merck Laboratories, the multi-gazillionaire, brilliant mind, and the nicest man you can meet. Ever, uh, ever. Just, and he's always like that. That's exactly right. And, and we, I say this every night we have a podcast, and I apologize for people who watch more of these. Bayshore Christian matters. Per capita, our graduates have impacted their community, their school, their professions more than anyone else. You can have Tampa Catholic, Tampa Prep, whatever. At Bayshore, whether it's a homemaker, a preacher, a school teacher reaching kids, or Andre Stevenson saving the world at Merck, uh, your brother at uh, Lockheed Martin, we have some of the greatest people that have ever come out of Tampa, and that's something that we all should be proud of. And yeah, uh, here, yeah, yeah. I agree. I yeah, agree. Absolutely, absolutely. So we got uh, Miss Winant, uh, we got Andre, any uh, we got Dibs, uh, Coach Dibble. Uh, any final thoughts about Herman, and any final thoughts to wrap up? Uh, I cherish that experience. Uh, I'll never forget it, but I, I think about it often, more often here recently, since we are, we all connected again. Uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. I think it was formative for a lot of us to put us on the trajectory that we, uh, we went on. We, you know, we learned to be mentally tough. We were, uh, humble when we needed to be. And we were aggressive and arrogant when, when the time called for it, which was, was on the court. We knew we were going to win and we were going to win. And I think that informed a lot of our, uh, our uh, commitment to family, commitment to career, commitment to a particular path in life. And, and I think going there, and this, this might sound a bit cliche, kind of changed the trajectory of me and Kelvin's life because uh, I remember one day uh, in the spring, uh, the counselor, I forget her name, but she comes running up to me. She's like, Kevin, 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 you scored a 19 on the ACT. And uh, back then that was, that was huge. And I'm like, wow, I didn't even study for it. So she was like, you've got options. I'm like, okay. All was, right. her, was her name Jerry Murray? I think it might have been. Okay. I think it might have been. Yeah, she was like, you've got options. And, and again, it was something I didn't even study for it. So imagine if I actually would have studied for it. I just kind of took it one day on, on a, probably on a dare if I was bored or something. But uh, yeah, that, that place, Bay Shore, special, special place. I tell everybody where I graduated from high school, and, and again, I think it kind of, at least for me, changed the trajectory of, of, uh, of the rest of my life. And I love it. That is really awesome. And thank you for sharing that. John Harville online said, uh, is congratulating you and saying very, very well said. And I totally agree with that. That is very well said and uh, couldn't be said better. Uh, I can't thank you enough, brother, for being here. This is 
This has been a unique podcast because we started off with a social dissertation on the history <laughs> of the United States. And I don't think that's ever happened on any of these, uh, but uh, that's been awesome. And I can't thank you enough for doing it. What a great story and, and uh, great stories that you've shared with everyone here. So thank you very much. No problem. Love, loved it. All right, brother. Well, we got to, I'm going to be coming to Houston after the high school basketball season. So probably right after the new year sometime. Okay. We got to get together in the spring or summer next year, another big, get everybody together, Bayshore gathering. So yeah, I'll show you around Houston. I'll show I'm you around Houston. To, I'm looking forward to it. Okay. All right, my friend. Great to see you. Thank you very much. All right. Take care. You too.